welcome to shedding light on the Mac OS Spotlight Desktop Search Service. Uh, it's, it's a rule, apparently, to have something about shedding light or a flashlight or something anytime you're talking about a spotlight thing, so I figured I'd play along with everyone else. Uh, I, am a, I do our research and development for Black Bag Technologies. Uh, before that, uh, I did some practitioner things, and before that, I was in academia for a while until they decided that they were done with me and they cut off my funding and told me to graduate. Uh, I do lots of things at the community, review boards and stuff, organize B-Sides NOLA, which we just announced, so tell all your friends. And uh, I've written some, some tools in the past that people around here may or may not have used. Uh, I'd also like to say uh, thanks to everyone for not just ditching after lunch. You know. Okay, so the very, very, very basics. This is a uh, spotlight is what supports desktop search on Mac OS. So if you click the little magnifying glass in the upper left, you're using spotlight. If you use the finder window, you're using spotlight. It indexes file content and file metadata. Ignore the fact that it indexes file content for the duration of my talk. We're talking about metadata stuff only. There are a bunch of pieces to it. There's, there's server processes that run. There's an API you can access. There's command line tools. There's all kinds of uh, pieces to this kind of thing um, that makes it a little confusing sometimes. It's mostly undocumented by Apple. Um, and we're going to focus on metadata only for Mac OS, and I think for the first time anywhere, iOS stuff. So the store basically just holds key value pairs. That's, that's all we care about. KMD item, something or other, equals a date or a time or, or whatever. Uh, and also keep in mind that this is an ongoing area of research I've been poking at for, for years, and as we'll see later, any third-party app can register itself to have metadata for its own files inserted into the Spotlight uh, Index. Uh, so anybody can put stuff in there and not document what is there or why or what behavior it specifically means, which makes it a little bit like the registry in that you have to go digging around to see what could possibly show up. So one little why do you care thing. Um, so this is from one of my personal machines, and it's using one of the command line tools to figure out some stuff about what I've been doing. And we can see that the, the Google Chrome.app is the application, that it has a use count of 121. And then I was pretty surprised to see that there were 80 past dates when I had used Google stored in Spotlight. So it's date only. Uh, and that use count is a little weird, because sometimes it's incremented by one or two or three, depending on how you run the app. But tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of date stuff. Uh, for application execution. This is even a little more interesting to me because this is for a folder. It's a use count for a folder. So when you open the folder in Finder, the use count can be incremented, and you have dates when the folder was used. So somebody says, I never touched the folder with the nasty pictures in it, and you can go, no, you touched it 76 times on exactly these days, and it's all just sitting there in Spotlight waiting for us to play with. Plus, uh, all this other kind of stuff is in Spotlight, and you never know what other third-party app could be running that also puts its data into Spotlight as well. But there's definitely activity related to locations and printers and phone numbers and calendar items and stuff that you can pin to specific users, even with a volume-level Spotlight database. Uh, so tons and tons of things. Plus, everybody's favorite, so many timestamps. There's a command you can run on your Mac OS system that will list all of the metadata attribute names that, that are known on your system. And I went and dug around and found everything that looked like it might be a time. Those are just the ones that are on my personal laptop. There's potentially way, way, way more timestamps related to all kinds of things. Uh, plus all of these things that look like timestamps that are uh, the Outlook stuff is clearly like a third party application that's registered some Spotlight stuff. Some of these things look like timestamps. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Who really knows? Uh, so there's a lot of, I'll say this over and over again, there's a lot more work to do with digging around with what's in here. So quick shout outs to everyone else who's been working on this stuff for a while because I've been keeping up with it and lots of people have their hands in it. At 50 Forensics, we got a DARPA, DARPA Cyber Fast Track grant in 2013 and wrote a tool and gave it away like bad capitalists and then at some point had to take the tool down. There was a data leakage thing from F-Secure. Sarah Edwards has been playing with the stuff and posting interesting things, which we'll refer back to. Lee Whitfield has also looked into timestamps in there. Um, Yogesh finally released an, a free open source tool so that anyone can go parse these databases and look at them in, in 2018. And he's figured out that in addition to volume level stores, there are stuff inside of user databases. Uh, this is Edwal Scanlon and LeCag published a paper uh, that also details some of the internal structure, but still, even with all of this stuff, we still don't know all of the internal structure and we still don't know uh, what all can be inserted in there. 
So I said it's complicated, and it is. The whole system relies on FS events. The spotlights, the base spotlight server is a subscriber to the FS events system so that anytime there's an update to the file system, files created, deleted, uh, attributes are changed or whatever, uh, FS events notifies the spotlight server. Uh, the spotlight server calls this metadata importer for the file type to go grab the metadata for this particular file type and stick it into the store. So third parties can register these, and there's a bunch built in to OS X, uh, to Mac OS itself. The metadata importers take out the stuff, the good stuff, uh, hand it to the Spotlight server, which then pushes it into this content and metadata store. That's the things that we actually care about, the files on disk that have all the goodies. So that at some point, via an API, other tools like the command line tools and Finder itself can access all of the stuff. So tons of moving pieces. It's good to have a, an overview of how this whole thing works, though. So like I said, there are multiple different types of stores. There's a, there are spotlight stores stored at the root of the volume. Uh, there are also spotlight stores uh, inside of user uh, home directories, and there's also separate things on iOS. So volume level spotlight stuff first. Uh, it exists at this path that we see and has tons and tons and tons of files, but the ones that we really care about are the volume configuration .plist, which will tell you which file path this particular store refers to. Usually it's the root of the volume. Uh, and it can also tell you what folders are ignored by Spotlight, because you can configure that if you want to hide things from Spotlight, potentially. Then you'll have a store v1, which we ignore. It's old. Store v2 is where good things are. There are different individual stores in any there. You can have multiple stores on a volume. And each store has a store.db and a dot store.db and a cache folder. The metadata attributes themselves are stored in the store.db and dot store.db file. They're basically copies of one another. It looks like the dot store.db gets written to first because occasionally it'll have just a few more entries and then the stuff's duplicated over into the store.db. For the rest of the talk, if I say something for store, dot store, they're, they're basically interchangeable, right? Then there's this cache directory, which I found super interesting that I don't know if has been talked about much, but um, there's a giant hierarchy uh, of, of files underneath this cache folder, like we see up top, of just four-digit numbers that don't have any particular meaning until you get down to an actual file itself. So we see down here that there's a text file called 416864.txt, and if we look at the text in the file itself, uh, just pay attention to the first line or so, first name, Josh, there's a street address and an email address and, and a few other things in there. So the name of the file, 416864. If you go to the file system itself and find the file whose inode is 416864 or whatever that number was, uh, you'll see where, the, where that text in the cache file came from. It came from this file, which again has uh, the Josh whatever and the phone number and the email address. So that number lets you um, link these, these cache folders, cache files, uh, directly to an on-disk file. There are definitely examples of cache files still existing when the disk file does not. So we don't know the mechanism of when they're created or deleted, but there's definitely content there. There's also a bunch of them that look like the cache files. They say .txt, but they're, they're binary plists. They start with you know, bplist00, but they don't parse in any tool that I've seen so far. So I don't know what that is either. OK, so store.db.store.db is where all the good stuff. It's a pretty complicated file format, but the basics are it starts off with a header with a known signature, and the header part has pointers to other, other things that we care about, including a page map, which keeps track of which pages are in use inside of this uh, database-looking uh, creature that we're going to look at a little more deeply. It has pointers to these uh, attribute tables. There are five tables near the beginning of the file that hold, um, that hold uh, strings that are commonly used, like attribute names that are used over and over and over again, and some other stuff. Uh, and then the records themselves, so records there's at least one per file on the system that's indexed by Spotlight. Uh, there are occasionally more than one, which we'll see. The pages themselves are usually compressed with either deflate or LZ4. So pages of records, an individual record keeps track of itself, of it, the inode that it refers to and the parent inode. I use inode instead of you know, catalog ID or whatever it is the file system uses to identify a file. Uh, so it keeps track of that. We're gonna look at all this just a little bit closer and quickly, because as Lee pointed out, I have too many slides. So this is the file header, 8 PSD. It's easy to find and easy to see, and it's always there, and it never changes. Uh, a set of flags. Uh, the page, the, this is the offset in 4K blocks to the page map, the second big chunk of the file. Uh, this is the size of the page map, and you know, 
this might be a little too small to see, but the slides are available and, and you get the gist. Uh, and then five uh, UNT32s that are offsets to each of the five attribute tables. So if we go look at one of these offsets, um, oh, one more thing in there is the path, the original path, the path to the file itself, the stored IDB file itself. If you're uh, doing research on this stuff like me and you have a folder with a bunch of these stored IDB files and you forgot where they came from, this might help you narrow it down <laughs> later. It has helped me. Okay, the attribute tables themselves, right? Um, if we go look at the address of the first one, the offset of the first one, we'll see that again there's a, there's a, a page header here, which is nice, and we can clearly see that all of the strings for KMD item, blah, 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 are all spelled out uh, in this one particular thing. A consequence of this is that if you want to later go try to reconstruct records, all of the things you need to make one record are not just in one little blob in the file. They're kind of scattered about. Uh, if we go look at the second attribute table, again, a page header and some, uh, there's a second. So this, these tables can also, I need to mention, they don't always fit in one page. And so you can have a next page uh, field that's set, so the, the table can, can, can go over multiple pages um, in the database. So you can track the next page that holds more of this attribute table by this next, attribute, uh, next page thing. And then this text itself is part of, um, part of the, the values, key value stuff. This is specifically for um, like a, the item type things, you know, public.email, public.item.jpg, whatever. So again, stuff in attribute tables uh, is record data, but separated from the records. The other attribute tables generally just hold um, offsets into these attribute tables. So a record, uh, it's a super complicated thing that I, I'm not gonna dig into a, a lot, but the, the, the format is complicated, as we'll keep seeing. So where are the records themselves that we actually care about? Oh, I just found the clock, that's nice. Uh, <laughs> Uh, records organized into, into pages, they're compressed. Uh, they have these fields and some other ones, but these are the ones that we care about, usually the inode and its parent um, and flags, a unique identifier, because as we'll see, the inode is not a unique identifier, because you can have multiple records for the same file, and a date updated. Uh, to add to the complexity here, all of the fields with an asterisk are stored not as like in int64 or in int32, they're stored as variable length integers. Depending on the size of the integer, they can be from one to nine bytes. This means looking at this stuff in a hex editor and trying to make sense of it is not, not nice. So we can see a page header for, um, for the records and note that all of this content is following this is all, it's all compressed garbage, right? Uh, the page length, which is almost always the same, the amount of the page that's actually used, uh, flags that indicate if the thing is compressed and what type of compression, so here it's obviously compressed, uh, and the uncompressed length. So you can use this uh, as like parameters to deflate or LZ4 or whatever, so you know, know what you're supposed to end up with. All right, so I went and uncompressed a single page just so we could um, go look at an uncompressed page. And so the hex down at the bottom, you can see that there are uh, tons of useful strings in there for strings and, and, and grep type people. Uh, so you might think that's it's useful, but keep in mind they're in compressed pages and the stuff in between them is with these variable length integers that are, that are a giant mess. And there's levels, there's more levels of complexity that are, that are required to actually get to a record um, that are kind of terrifying. Uh, which is why I think it took so long for somebody else to write an open source tool that does this. It's, uh, it's a pain. You basically have <laughs> an offset into the, into the first attribute table that says the key name, and then you'll have an offset into some of the other tables that will in turn have offsets into other tables, and you chase this around for a bit and try not to mess it up, and hopefully you get back something that makes sense. So contents for the volume level store specifically. Um, I'm assuming most people have seen this stuff before, and I want to focus more on the, 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 other, the other types. Um, but a cool tidbit is, so I keep saying that you could have multiple, um, multiple records for a single file. We don't know the mechanism for which this exists. Maybe it was a, an OS update or an update to Spotlight itself, or maybe there's some 30 pages or something, but we can clearly see here that the object identifier between these two highly snipped records uh, is the same but the file name is different and the date updated of the record itself is different. So 
you have these kind of historical records in the database, and you have historical databases via snapshots, and maybe you can uh, recover deleted spotlight indexes, you could potentially use this to create a, a, a kind of snapshot in time history of an individual file. You can see file name changes, you can see size changes, you can see all kinds of, of interesting things. Snapshot in time, so you won't get every change, but you know, you'll see some. User level spotlight stuff. Uh, this, is, this is interesting. So it used to be the case that Spotlight only indexed things in terms of uh, whole files. Now Spotlight can index uh, sub-file entities, like a single database record for a message in an SMS or a single, you know, whatever, Twitter thing. Uh, so the directory structure for the user level stuff uh, looks like these two guys. Uh, so the top one I actually just noticed recently, but it looks like it's all built in uh, indexing of, of like help menu stuff. So not, not user generated content. I, I only looked at it for a little bit, but it didn't seem like there was interesting stuff there, but I didn't want to neglect to mention it either. And uh, the one that we actually care about, the second one. So in the user's home directory under library, media, core spotlight, index, dot whatever, uh, you'll have uh, store files again. So the store files the same as the volume level ones? Uh, kind of, they're almost the same. In fact, the file format really is, is exactly the same. The interesting tidbits here are that it obviously relates to activity and, and items of interest about a specific user because it's in their home directory. Uh, and the unknown part. So the inode uh, field for all of the records in the user level database, it's all just some large positive or negative integer or I'm misinterpreting it. It's definitely no longer an inode which makes sense if these things are addressing kind of sub-file uh, entries, which is bad for us. And the parent is always zero too. So with the volume level records, if you have inode and parent, that allows you to reconstruct paths for the files, which is uh, nice to have because the path isn't actually stored in an individual record. Uh, these guys don't really allow you to do the same thing. So otherwise, it's effectively the same as the volume level file format. So what kind of stuff can you find in there? So Safari history items. Uh, it gives you the URL, a description, a last used date, used counts, and a page visit count. So all of, all of these counts and times are, are not very well explored and needs a ton of experimentation to find out uh, you know, what they actually mean. But the fact that all of this interesting stuff is being recorded is kind of, kind of the fun part for right now. Uh, like I said, it's not linked to um, to a file itself, but lots of these records have things that look like the bottom row and an external ID, and there's other ID-typed uh, fields that don't have any completely obvious meaning, but maybe somehow that is the linkage to where this particular uh, history record resides, either in a plist or in a database or maybe in a file or wherever, wherever it sits based on the version of macOS, right? Safari bookmarks, same thing. So you get the, the URL for the bookmark itself and then the description. Uh, notes, I never actually used notes under Mac OS, so I wanted to see if notes stuff popped up, so I wrote a note that says I am a note, uh, and it did in fact appear in the Spotlight database. So the actual text of the note is there in addition to the time when it was created and if it was modified and when and a description and all kinds of other information, the kind of you know, metadata about the individual note that you may or may not get from, from other sources and you certainly don't get like in the notes UI, right? Maps, this is another one that I wanted to poke into uh, a little bit more, but uh, time is short. So uh, doing map search in the, in the Mac OS Max, uh, Maps app uh, generates content that's indexed by Spotlight. Uh, the most interesting part is where I have that arrow is this is a, a few hundred bytes of base 64 encoded, I don't know exactly what yet. Uh, but it almost certainly has latitude and longitude or the picture that was shown or something. We need to go, to go play around and see. Uh, again, with a, a use count uh, and a KMD item used dates, that can actually be a giant list of dates like we saw in the initial motivation slide. So all kinds of fun stuff here. The Mac News app. A uh, similar thing, so uh, I'm a crypto fan, so I went looking around in the news app for stuff about crypto-y things, and it, it immediately, uh, this was generated in Spotlight. So 
Support for Bitcoin's Lightning Network. Yay, fun. Uh, again, with another, so this also has like an external ID, but it doesn't, like that other thing was like a hex string, and this isn't a hex string, so it's another version of an external ID that may be able to link us back to the original artifact, but I haven't figured that part out yet. So all these previous ones were built-in apps that are on all of the systems, right? Uh, I also heavily use uh, Evernote to organize the stuff that rattles around in my brain. Uh, and it turns out that Evernote is one of these third-party apps that has registered uh, an importer so that when you do stuff in Evernote, it gets indexed by Spotlight. So this is me uh, looking around at the Windows 10 notification database, specifically the wall, and, and, and seeing what was in there. So the title of the thing, when it was created, and when and if it was modified, along with, again, uh, an external ID and bundle IDs. Weren't we just talking about those? There's bundle IDs for all of these things. Keep in mind that all of, I probably should have mentioned this first, all of these things that I'm showing you are you know, four or five or six of the, of the metadata items, and there's generally more like 20 or 30 of them. There's plenty more stuff. Uh, cut out all of the things that were less interesting so you could maybe read it on a slide. Uh, but there's way, way, way more stuff. And uh, you know, I'm not, there may be other interesting things that I just don't see as interesting. So I hope I'm impressing upon you that you need to go dig around in these things. Okay, iOS spotlight stuff. So this is a little bit different. I don't think anybody has been able to play around in these things before. At least uh, I haven't seen anybody who has. So I wasn't even sure that there was spotlight on iOS until, mm, I don't know, six or eight months ago. So if you have a great key extraction or if you root a phone or whatever, the, that path up at the top gives you uh, these three subdirectories. There are three separate Spotlight stores on iOS uh, that relate to the security settings on the device. The NS file protection stuff is not my area of expertise, but mm, there's different stuff in all of them. <laughs> uh, and under each folder, you'll have an index.spotlightv2 and a store, store.db, and a cache folder, just like we've seen before, uh, plus all of these other uh, db string one uh, dot map dot whatever, uh, which I'll tell you how they're relevant in a sec, uh, plus again, dozens and dozens and dozens of other files here. So the iOS store structure is similar to the store structures of the volume level and user level stuff, except for the fact that the attribute tables are missing. They're just not there. So if you go try to parse it with uh, code that expects a normal Spotlight store, uh, you get nothing because there's, <laughs> there's no key names <laughs> anywhere in the file. They're not there. I've uncompressed everything and dug around. They're definitely not there. Uh, so they're actually stored in those dot map whatever files. So there's, there's a, for each attribute table, there's uh, five text files, five text files uh, that, that hold all of the stuff that you need to parse the attribute table data to be able to go get stuff out of iOS. So uh, it's one of those painful things where in order to, I want to decode the store file, but I actually have to touch, to decode the spotlight store on iOS means three different stores with like 25 external files a piece. You have to parse like 100 files in the freaking file system to get this to show you anything, anything reasonable. Uh, also, like the user level stuff, it doesn't use an, an actual like inode to refer back to a file. It uses mm, something else. What are some things that we can get? Uh, SMS messages, including snippets from the message. I didn't actually type any of these things. It's from a phone that's not mine. Uh, but you get uh, who sent it and when and the phone numbers and the message text itself. Uh, I mean, just uh, all kinds of fun stuff. It, there's uh, alternate names in there, uh, tons and tons and tons of things. iMessagey stuff, so same thing, uh, similar kind of thing, uh, wherein you also get a snippet, so you actually get the text of the message itself without having to have any of the databases or anything like that. Uh, and contact information for the people who are doing it, including phone numbers and, and alternate names and email addresses and just, I mean, a ridiculous wealth of information, all right? Uh, similar thing with maps, only where before the, the, I think the juicy maps data was in that base64 encoded blob that I didn't, didn't do anything with. On iOS, the maps entries uh, actually give you like latitude, longitude, and eight, eight different fields that all tell you the address in one form or another. So super, super, super specific and fun. Oh, and a use count and use dates. And bad formatting on my part. Ooh. Uh, reminders, 
including the title of the reminder, when the reminder was set, the completion date, uh, you know, uh, all of this kind of stuff. Again, all basically just sitting there in spotlight as, as, as yet, as far as I know, uh, untouched by anyone. Uh, this was a phone I didn't have any control over, so I just went scrolling around looking for fun things. There could be way, 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 way more stuff in there if it was a phone that was under regular use by an iOS power user. This is one of our test phones from work. Calendar events, same thing. The title of the calendar event, when the calendar event was for, the expiration date, uh, account identifiers, I don't know what they are, bundle IDs are everywhere, so we should talk after this. Um, Contact information uh, also in there, so I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but lots of stuff. Uh, email, I didn't find any particularly interesting email stuff, except that this looks like it points to a Gmail account, and it may just be the case that, that mail wasn't used a whole lot on this test phone. Uh, so I expect there to be way, way, way more email stuff. Third-party apps, so Twitter on your iPhone is going to generate stuff that gets indexed by Spotlight. So we have no idea what happens if you remove Twitter if what happens to the stuff that's indexed in Spotlight. I assume it goes away. The volume level stores uh, aggressively delete content when you delete a file. If you delete a file, the content inside the volume level store is removed instantly or within seconds or maybe minutes. It's, it's barely not there at all. I don't have uh, any idea for, for iOS and the user level things yet. Okay, so tons of fun stuff there. That's all great. I haven't told you how you can get it yet. <laughs> There are command line tools uh, on Mac OS that will let you go query these things that we've seen uh, little, little pieces of. If you want to know how to use these way better, go look at Sarah's blog post that I linked to earlier in the presentation. She's got tons of great examples there. We don't need to go into it. But anyway, these command line tools exist in iOS. I uh, jailbroke a, in Mac OS. I jailbroke a, an iPhone like six months ago, and I couldn't find any of these tools there to query the index directly. So they weren't there, or they weren't there on that version of iOS, or I screwed something up, which is possible. Uh, the MDFind and MDLS are really your friends. MDFind is like find, but it gives you metadata attributes instead of, it looks for metadata attributes instead of like a file name, and MDLS, instead of listing the file size and whatever, lists all of the metadata stuff for that particular file. You can daisy chain these things together. There's a whole language for regular expressions and filtering on sizes, and it's a whole other talk on its own. So you can use those things uh, if you have a running system and Spotlight to query on the running system. If you just have a stored IDB file from some extraction somewhere, you'll guess put out Spotlight Parser. I stole this uh, text from his website. It's uh, super simple to use. You just basically run this on the store file uh, and an output directory and you get, uh, you get a list of all the metadata attributes in one file and another file that gives you all of the file paths reconstructed with the inode uh, that it goes to the record, so you have to do a little bit of um, looking back and forth, but it's uh, open source and, and free and cool. Uh, today we're releasing a thing called Illuminate, because uh, we needed a name that revolved around light or something. It's a free command line tool for parsing spotlight thingies. It'll parse the full Spotlight V100 directory. It'll do carving. If you, I don't know if I said this already, if you Google for Spotlight, whatever stuff, tons of people uh, have problems with it, and the prevailing advice is to delete the Spotlight directory uh, and let it re-index because it starts using up too much CPU, which leads me to believe there are lots of old machines with lots of deleted Spotlight directories sitting around. Usage overview, you know, we don't need to dig into this because I have some examples, but you can give it a store file, you can give it a Spotlight dash v100 directory, you can give it an iOS thing, you can give it a blob and tell it to carve. Uh, it'll do paths for you, so we see it'll give you the metadata attribute and all the stuff, but also the path to the file. Uh, you can give it the entire installation folder, and it will parse out the volume configuration plist, and, and so there's fun things there like excluded directories and the path where the, the store is for. It will also parse the cache files, so you can see that this particular file, the path up top in bold, uh, and then the path to the cache file itself in bold, um, and then the data, a data snippet that was in that cache file. We limit it to like 256 bytes because... Um, because some of them are like a meg, and you don't want to just dump all the stuff all over the place. Uh, you can carve just by giving it some blob, and it'll, it'll pull out files that uh, and tell you the offset and the length and pull them out into a directory you can specify. Uh, by default, it does this trying to weed out false positives, but you can um, give it the dash A flag for aggressive or all, or I, don't, I wrote this thing, I don't even know what it means. But, uh, and it'll carve a whole bunch more files, but they're likely to be a lot of junk, but you can have them if you want.
Oh, okay, so I uh, hope I've impressed upon you that there's an awful lot of stuff in there that you need to go poking around because the data is just, it's a ridiculously uh, dense artifact uh, for stuff that's super fun. Go play with the iOS things, use this stuff on like real world devices and, and let me know uh, what, what all is in there that's interesting, and, you know, and I'll share more stuff that I find. This is, uh, it's a black bag thing, but it's kind of my little baby, so please don't call black bag tech support and have Christina try to do tech support for this tool. That, that's contact information for me. Definitely feel free to reach out uh, anytime and complain or yell or scream or say thanks or don't. Uh, that's the link where the executables are, so offers that black bag slash spotlight. It should be up there now. If it isn't or is broken, somebody let me know. And with four minutes and 40 seconds left to go, are there questions? No.